Let us give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May our overseas believers also greet each other. Let us give the answer to the unbelievers. Let us give them the answer. We must give them an answer. This world does not have the answer. And even for those who are here, if you do not have the answer, may you discover the answer. The majority lives without answers. The majority has no, no answers. They just put in a lot of effort. They shave their head, hair, and they try to do all these things. They try this and that, and they wander around because they have no answer. They go here, they go there, and they wander around. And they are always shaken because they have no answer, because they have not come to the conclusion. And so they live such pitiful lives, exhausting lives. Father God, may you allow me to discover the answer this morning. Today's message is entitled, A Generation with Absolute Faith. As Jesus carried out his public ministry, the most important ministry he considered was raising disciples. the disciple of Jesus because the disciples were the spiritual runners who would take up the baton after Jesus completed his work on earth and continue God's plan to save lives and souls these those individuals were the disciples so that they can continue Nowadays, world churches and current churches, they do not have disciples. There are a lot of people, but they don't have disciples. What's the difference between people and disciples? People, they just come and go. They don't feel anything or sense anything by themselves. They just come and go. It's just the religion of Christianity. However, a disciple is different. A disciple does not come and go alone, but whatever they do, they share the gospel to everyone they meet, and they give them the answer and heal them and, accept, and allow them to accept God and bring them to church. That's the difference between a person, an average person, and a disciple. A disciple has an answer, and thus the content of their lives is completely different. And that's why Jesus emphasized the disciples and that because disciples are so important. He was with the disciples. They lived with the, he lived with the disciples 24 hours. He ate and slept with them. And in the field, he allowed the disciples to see and experience the living works of God. And he allowed them to repeatedly hear and see the works of, of the kingdom of God and train them continuously. However, unfortunately, the disciples did not meet Jesus' expectations. And so, Jesus always made these frustrated expressions concerning the disciples. And what's one of the significant expressions was, do you not yet perceive or understand? This is what Jesus said to the disciples. Do you not yet perceive or understand? This was a repeated expression. For instance, after performing the miracle of the five loaves and two fish target, targeted to the Jews, and then he performed a similar miracle of seven loaves and two fish targeted to the Gentiles. Yet, even in the same circumstance, the disciples failed to understand and realize to these disciples, Jesus says, Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? This expression is also directed at us. It is a, an expression directed to me. We repeatedly say amen as we listen to the word and worship. But strangely enough, the moment we leave the church, we remember very little. The moment we leave church, there's very little that we remember. And so to remember the sermon title and main points, that person is quite impressive. But I don't think there are, I think there are very, very few who can remember that. It's quite strange, isn't it? After you watch a movie, you 
it's so easy to talk about the the movie to your friends and your family if you watch the recent movie if you had seen the scenes and the action show action scenes then you it would be easy to share about it with others but when it comes to the word it's difficult to even share because you forget everything and so when other people say something you remember every single thing and you even add on to it but then when it comes to the word of god you, there's nothing for you to say and speak about even after having attended church for decades and that is why forum is so important this is something that we our church has while other churches don't have when you go to a restaurant and have forum with the pulpit message and then to gather with your family members and have forum and to gather with close friends and forum about what you realized from the pulpit with through your mouth other people hear it and receive grace it's very important when people say things through your their mouth, they do not forget. It's unforgettable. On Sunday evening, when you return home, you need to have a forum about the pulpit message with your family. And even if you do it once, you'll remember it throughout the week. And you'll probably remember. And you'll probably prepare to have forum. And you'll speak while having forum. And then you're bound to hold on to the word throughout the week and change and transformation is bound to take place. Their character and personality changes and their habits, their bad habits starts to change. And it's a transformation is imperative. But people don't change. And that's what the disciples did. And another significant expression from Jesus is found in today's passage. Oh, faithless generation. Oh, it's faithless. And it was a strong expression of lament and grieving. But it was not only directed to the Israelites, but it was also directed to the disciples and to us. Despite hearing and witnessing countless teachings and miracles, they still did not believe and remained in a state of unbelief. Why is that? It was because they could not break free from the self-centered nature of Genesis 3. And the incorrect imprints in them had become firm partisan that had deeply rooted inside them. An incorrectly imprinted partisan. The scars that they received from childhood and that character that was formed incorrectly and those bad habits, it all remained in them. And that is why new imprints are emphasized many times. As today's message title proclaims, a genuine transformation from a faithless gen generation to a generation of absolute faith is imperative. Faith overcomes. Who overcomes the world? One who has faith. Therefore, true transformation. Last week's message said transformation is imperative. Amen. You must be transformed. You must continuously be transformed. And when I look at that elder, he has changed a lot. When I look at that deacon, that in encourager, they've changed a lot compared to last year. And I can, their faith is fragrant. That type of transformation. But people, they do not transform. It's all religion. Religion does not transform. And so it says to to be transformed from the essence, from water to wine. But then people say, oh, it's, a, it's a mess, the same message each week. When it comes to a walk of faith, it means you must experience renewal and growth each and every day. Each week, each day, newly. Growth and transformation is what you must experience. Without transformation, it would be boring. It would There would be no anticipation, no butterflies. How would you have butterflies if there is no transformation? There needs to be joy, movement, and tears, but there's none because there is no transformation. 
But what is the platform of transformation and growth? It is faith. I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to stand firm as a generation with absolute faith and spread the good influence of the gospel as true disciples of Christ. Point number one, the restoration of absolute faith. Verses 14 to 16 read, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? Our passage today takes place on takes place after the incident of the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus had just come down from showing his three disciples the true hope, the eternal glory of heaven that will enable them to overcome future suffering and persecution. And so, and while when Jesus and the three disciples were on their way down the mountain, this incident had happened. Jesus and the three while the Jesus and the three disciples were on the mountain below the mountain were nine disciples uh, and a father had come with his son who was demon possessed and asked the disciples to heal him although the father had initially looked for Jesus since Jesus wasn't there the father had asked the disciples to heal his son with an urgent heart so they asked the, the father asked the disciples however the problem was that no matter how hard the nine remaining disciples tried to cast out the demon the demon did not budge he would not be cast out in short they were helpless there was nothing to do the the son kept seizing convulsing and there's nothing that could be done the scribes were watching them criticized and jeered at the disciples because they were following them trying to find their weakness and so at that time they criticized and jeered at the disciples and the disciples were in a hurry trying to make any excuses for that and it was at that moment Jesus appeared and when Jesus appeared the father of the demon possessed child came forward and he gave the full story about his son who was demon possessed and asked Jesus to heal his demon possessed son the father had brought his son who was suffering to the disciples but they were unable to heal him and at that point Jesus grieves and laments and verse 19 reads and he answered them O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. O oh, faithless generation. The disciples' problem Jesus diagnosed was their lack of faith. A faithless generation. Even while attending church, even while living a walk of faith, there's nothing else for you to do. May you do everything with faith. With faith, may you look at people. With faith, may you love. With faith, may you work. If you do it with your own righteousness, it can't be. Then you'll be deceived one day. You'll say, oh, but I did this. I did that. That's a person that has nothing to do with God. Mark 6, 7 to 13. The disciples had already experienced Jesus' power to cast out demons in the field. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. It says in Mark chapter 6. However, what was the difference between then and now? When they first went out and used the authority Jesus had given them in the field, how come they were there, they're unable to do it now? Back then, when they first went out and used the authority that Jesus had given them in the field, because it was the first time the disciples only thought about Christ alone, they looked to Jesus Christ alone. 
with fear and trembling hearts. They thought, oh, can we really cast out these demons? Can we really he heal the sick? Can we really do something? But they thought, oh, since Jesus has given us this power, we should just take his word, believe in his word, and try it. And with that fear, with that trembling heart, they tried it, and demons were cast out. And they were amazed by that. And they were shocked. Because the sick were healed, and they started to boast, oh, Jesus, we really did cast out demons in your name. Because that was our first experience. Great works took place. However, what about now? What was the situation? What dominated their hearts and minds were not only Christ alone, but it was their past experiences. They thought, oh, in the past, we cast out demons. So they tried to do this with their past experience. And so they thought, oh, since we had done it in the past, it would work this time also. Their chins were high up and they became arrogant. They said, oh, we've done it before. When our faith experiences become a point of bragging and arrogance, then we're being deceived by Satan. And that is why your faith does not grow. Oh, but I did this. I did this much. You will not grow. Your faith will not grow. And that is why you must be careful when you share a testimony. Because when you give a testimony, what happens? There, the, your stuff goes into it. And so it does not flow centered on Christ, on the Word, but it flows centered on yourself. And, and many people, they try to do this. But don't, it should be normal for you to not want to or be hesitant to give a testimony because you are hesitant because you're afraid that you might speak about yourself that Christ might disappear and you might only speak of yourself experience from the past of course is important but your current state is more important your current spiritual state that is important the absolute faith which focuses on only Jesus Christ an absolute faith not an average faith but an absolute faith in Acts 3, Peter healed the lame in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, Arise and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And seeing the man who used to beg in front of the temple gate stand up and walk, everybody was amazed. The lame, he stood up and walked and went into the temple gates. And many people started to see Peter with respect and thought, How amazing, how great! And with the eyes of religion, they saw Peter. And that's why Peter made this confession. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? This is what must be. Why are you looking at me? Did I do this? Amen? Was I the one to do this? It must disappear. When you do the works of God, if possible, you must disappear. And so Calvin, he died without a gravestone. Without a grave. Why do you focus on me? Did I do this? He meant for them to see only Christ, not him. Hebrews 12, 2 states, Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Let may we look to Jesus. I am nothing. There's nothing that I have done. And I'm just apologetic. Instead, this is genuine and absolute faith. Verses 21 to 23 read, And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. 
And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Verse 23 was a very popular verse in the past. Especially Pastor y o n g g i Cho had often used this verse and many impersonated him when reading this verse. Many people impersonated him, including me. However, this verse is not just a positive thinking or initiative mindset. And so, to people who are in a lot of scars and neg in negative situations, we're, uh, this verse was used for those people who were in negative situations and who had a negative mindset. However, faith is never an imitation, but a fact and reality. Faith is not something that can be done by imitating it. Just because you imitate someone else does not mean it will take place. But many people, they try to copy Pastor y o n g g i Cho. Many people, they practice and practice impersonating him. It was very, very similar. Faith is not simply thinking, oh, it will happen. When you believe, it will come true. No. What can you do? That's why many people have perished. I can do it. What can you do? What will you do? It's not some type of initiative mindset. And so, Pastor y o n g g i Cho was influenced by Pastor Joel Austin. Positive thinking. I've been to that church, Crystal Church in LA. It's very, very big. And the entire church is created of crystal, constructed with crystal. But if you go, they have many idols, starting with Moses, a sculptor of Moses, and even they even have a statue of the pastor himself inside the church. I was surprised. How could this be? How could a sculptor of the senior pastor be in the middle of the church? And I thought, oh, this church will perish. How dare he? This church will soon crumble. And after not a few months, years later, they become bankrupt, and the Catholic Church bought that property. He, Pastor Joel Austin, he emphasized the positive thinking. Many people were influenced by that, but they all crumbled in the end. Faith is seeing God's power. What does If you can mean from the passage, it means do not have a single doubt when it comes to the Word of God. What does this mean? It means to have absolute faith. Why do you doubt it? Do not doubt ever. Just believe the Word as is. There is a saying that goes, if God's ability is a powerhouse, faith is an electric wire. What does this mean? It tells us that even if you try to produce a large amount of electricity from a powerhouse, it all depends on the amount of the electricity that is being transmitted by the size of the wire. If you want to receive a lot of electricity, then the size of the wire needs to be big. And then Otherwise, it will explode. How much faith we have in ourselves. Even today, the choir is saying such a graceful praise. When it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit desires to give you power, but it all depends on the size of your faith. It, you receive it. The size of the wire, the size of your faith. So you lose as much as you doubt. And so if you doubt, don't even think about receiving. People who, are, who have a lot of skepticism and doubt, don't even think about receiving grace. Do not, be, do not even think about being used if you have a lot of doubt. All believers of Yewon Church, may you build a watchtower of absolute faith and experience the scale of God in whatever situation and circumstance. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Point number two, the experience of the absolute answer. 
And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. When Jesus entered the house after healing the demon-possessed boy, the disciples followed him and asked why they could not cast out the demons. However, what is interesting is that they did not just ask him, but they asked him privately, it said. They, the disciples asked him privately, why was that? Because the disciples were ashamed. They were ashamed. And it was at that moment Jesus made the disciples realize the absence of prayer in their lives, that, you d that they do not pray, that there was an absence of prayer. And that is why Jesus says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. In short, it meant that the disciples did not pray. Whenever they prayed, the disciples would sleep. They would not pray. In Matthew 17, 20, which contains the same content, Jesus answered, because of your little faith. It's the same scene. But here, it says that Jesus also said, because of your little faith. It seems like there are different answers, but they're not different at all. In fact, faith and prayer are inseparable. Faith and prayer. You pray only when you have faith. And when you pray, you know that you have faith. But what is the characteristic of people who have no faith? They do not pray. They only put up a facade. They pretend, but they do not pray. They have no time to pray. So look around you carefully. They're very eloquent, but they have no pray. Look at their result. Do they have fruits? There are no fruits. Faith and prayer. You must have faith to be able to pray. And the faith in God that God will answer my prayer. That realistic faith. And so how much faith should you have that you have to pray a realistic faith that believes in God that He will answer? But if you if you you don't have faith and that's why you don't pray and that's because you think that you will not receive answers when you pray, that's why you don't give much thought to your prayers. And that's why when you don't have faith, you do not pray. Beloved believers, may you pray. Hold on to the word of God and give a covenantal prayer. Because when you pray, your faith grows. Your faith grows. It's not the same faith. It's not the same electric wire anymore. for your nature, for your habits, for your character and your personality to change. And if you want to experience that word of God for myself, it started all with prayer. And when do you pray? When, I pr when do I pray? At 11 p.m. at night. Back then, I used to come to the church alone because there was no one at church. For our church, we have prayer caves. It's quite nice, right? Because you can go in the middle of the night. No one will report you. So I used to come to church at 11 p.m. when there was no one. And sometimes I felt like God was telling, asked, speaking to me and said, Unju, are you just coming now? And the hairs on my back would stand. It was as if God was waiting for me. I was working all day. I had dinner at home. I slept for an hour, took a nap, and came to church. It was a one-on-one -on -one time with God that I had. And I would wrestle like Jacob. Even if my hip bone would be broken, I'd kneel before God and I couldn't even stand. After early morning prayer, I had to go to work, but because I was kneeling all night long, I couldn't even stand. I had to go to work. I had to go to work because early, early morning prayer had ended, but I couldn't move my legs. But thankfully, my church, my house was right behind the church. It was a rotary apartment and I would I would drag my legs along holding onto the walls of the church building and you know what I felt at that time when when Jacob his hip bone was broken I I felt like I was I experienced that why because there is no other way to live aside from prayer without prayer we cannot do anything 
And we are, because we have no choice but to shout out to the Lord. May you create a spiritual virtuous cycle. Do you know what the significant char characteristics of a person who does not pray are? Is it, it, they use humanism. It's centered on humans, not God. They rely on humans. They look at humans. They, they think they use humanism and they always think about that. They try to use their brains. They have nothing to do with the word, without, with prayer. And so using humanism is a characteristic of a life that does not pray. And they cannot break free from a self-centered life of Genesis 3. They have made the Holy Spirit God who is within them an outsider and they try to do everything on their own. Their thought, their decision, their judgment. And so what is their characteristic? They're always tired. They're exhausted. Things are bound to not work out. And the disciples were in the state. They were trying to use their head, use humanism, look at people. In today's passage, when Jesus says there is no faith, in the original language, it means that they were continuously influenced by unbelief. A faithless generation, what that means is that they were continuously being influenced by unbelief. And as I look around, if there are people who continuously scatter unbelief, and if you surround yourself with that, then you will be, uh, you will be influenced by that and you won't be able to receive grace and that's why when you look at people who use humanism you will start using humanism and that's why when you look at people who use humanism if you look around them they're always influenced by other people who use humanism and that's why people qu are quickly follow when it comes to negative things if we do not pray we will naturally be influenced by unbelief we won't be ev even be able to discern because you do not pray Satan, who, the devil who is l ro like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, will be attacked by the devil. When you look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It, the power is in God, not to us. And therefore, you must hold on to the word and pray. And may you firmly hold on to the fact that our spiritual strength sprouts from the prayer of absolute faith that only looks at Jesus Christ alone. That strength sprouts from prayer. And that is why the prayer of seven bardisms that establishes the bardism of God, the prayer of seven journeys that follows the journey of God, and the prayer of seven guideposts that follows the guideposts of God are encouraged to do so. And doing this every morning, daytime, and night is getting into a spiritual rhythm and that is when you are able to interpret everything spiritually. You must be able to interpret everything spiritually, even inside problems and incidents, because then you'll see that there is an answer in problems, crisis is an opportunity, and conflict is a time schedule of renewal. That is the three answers. For believers, there is no crisis, no conflict, because we're about to receive answers. And when you do this, then the field where you currently are will become the platform that saves lives. And the watchtower and antenna will be established. And you become a main figure. Even if you're a slave, even if you're imprisoned, even wherever you are, you become a main figure. With the three platforms, the three antennas, the three watchtowers, you will be used. In a word, centered on you who prays, the field will be organized, and the field is bound to move. And pointing to this, we call that an absolute partisan has been established. And we must realistically experience this answer and open the age of the three-day weekend and imprint this in our remnants. It's nothing difficult. The seven bars and seven journeys and seven guideposts, this was, we gave this out last week. On the bulletin, look at the bulletin last week, and may you put it inside your pockets. Take a photo of it with your phones and look at it. When we deeply meditate on that spiritual meaning and pray, and when you look at it, you pray, Father God, 
and in the end pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Then the works of the Triune God is bound to work put inside you. I bless all Yewon Church members in the name of the Lord to be the main figures of the covenant fulfillment who enlarge the four main taints with this spiritual power. This is a conclusion. There is something we should pay attention to in today's passage. It is a confession made by the father of the demon possessed child to Jesus in verse 18. He says, I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. In fact, there is no further unfortunate expression than this. He came to the disciples for the answer to the problem, but the disciples were unable to give the Father an answer at all. However, this is the same for this age. So many people in this world of Genesis chapter 3 are suffering from serious, invisible spiritual problems. And it's filled with problems. And they are afflicted by various problems that came to them unexpectedly one day. Students, they ha under the stress of, of their academics, with their friends, with their teachers and their parents, they become mad. And that is why Harvard, Seoul National University, and Keist University, they have many, many suicides because of various problems. I read the bulletins of all our departments from our infant ministry, our children's ministry, our youth, our college, our young adults. I look at all of their bulletins. Our high schoolers, I know that there are many students who have a lot of problems, but they don't even know that this is a spiritual problem. And this one high schooler made this confession and testimony that said, oh, he he felt compassion for many students around him who were wandering around without knowing what the spiritual problem is. And, but because he has an answer, he looked at them with compassion. And he saw, while seeing his friends and other students who would not receive this answer, and he gave this testimony where he wants to give them the answer. Inside their hearts, they have their struggle with these problems, and they're on they're suffering, and they're unable to sleep. However, answers are not being given. Starting from the president, there is no answer. Even the president's wife, the first lady, they do not have an answer. Politicians, they just go back and forth. But they have no answer. Look at the politicians. Look at the, the economists. Look at around you. Who are there that has the answer? There is no one other than you. And that is why I, I had you greet each other to say, let's give the answer to the religious individuals and to the unbelievers. There is no answer. This is the reality of the Korean church and worldwide churches. There is no answer. No one is able to give the accurate answer because the churches are oblivious to the spiritual realm and while the church is following the physical things, their organizations and religious organizations and all cults and heresies are seizing control of the world. They are taking over cultures and businesses, planting a Nephilim idolatry culture. For example, recently, BTS, BTS, who has become worldwide and globally popular, famous. The entertainment that they belong to is named HYBE. And recently, they had a management dispute over the management rights. But then, th there were rumors of co their connection to Dan World. Dan World and HYBE categorically deny each other's connection and say they will take legal action. Still, six of the seven BTS members are graduates of the Global Cyber University, which was established by Lee Sung Hun, the leader of Dan World. At the Global Cyber University, they teach transcendental meditation. And what happens if you practice transcendental meditation? Spiritual problems are bound to come. We meditate on the word of God, but for them, it's a transcendental meditation. And everyone has fallen into this. 
we are looking at this reality of the field. Where are you living right now? You are currently living inside the spiritual disaster zone. That's what the field has become. Other people other, do not have the answer. Whether they go to church, whatever religion they have, they have no answer. Regardless of that, the field has no answer. May you give the answer. What is the answer? Only Christ, only the kingdom of God, only the filling of the Holy Spirit. That is the answer. Starting today, if you look, if you call only upon only Christ, enjoy only the kingdom of God, and pray for only the filling of the Holy Spirit, then all your spiritual problems will be solved. There is no answer other than only Christ. None. When we give the as we hold on to the three only the gospel of uniqueness and we give them the answer that is when that person will be revived it doesn't matter whether that person has is successful or they live a good life it does not matter when i was in germany there was a church there that commissioned there was a there a, Ho Jin Kim, a famous singer, was a remnant that was raised by our church in Germany, and we supported him because he was poor. But now, after he became famous, he completely disappeared, and he left the church. And so, it takes just one thing for unbelievers. It doesn't matter; they have not been saved. But even. Though, but God starts to intervene when you are saved, when you receive salvation. The whole, the, when it came to the Israelites, it wasn't that they asked them, it wasn't that they asked to be chosen, but God had chosen them. And when they did not listen, God intervened. And so when it comes to believers, you may say, oh, why is it that this happens when we are believers and you do less than even the unbelievers? You live a less quality life than unbelievers. But that's what happens when salt loses its taste. It, when salt loses its taste, they become trampled. That's what Jesus said. When salt loses its taste and when the children of God loses their taste, they're thrown out. All believers of Yeh One Church, as you hold on to this answer, May you stand as witnesses who brings true healing by proclaiming the gospel of uniqueness in the field and boldly stand as a generation of absolute faith. Let us pray. Father God, may we form a generation of absolute faith. The world has no answers. God, may we be able to give this absolute answer to our neighbors, to the field, to all people. May we become the main figures who save lives. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.